Okay, so the recording's now getting started, so I'm going to start sharing my screen with you guys. So tonight's plan is to go over the last practice exam that I posted. Right, so I'm not going to quite make it full screen so I can still see uh, if you guys have comments. Um, not quite sure how comments working, so turning on your volume and asking me um, in person might work better. Um, so if you missed yesterday's session, that is uploaded. If you go on to Husky CT, um, you can go under virtual SI videos. I wasn't able to upload it directly to Husky CT. It just kept giving me errors, which is why it took me a while to get it up last night. Um, but they're all posted on YouTube. Um, but I will post the links in that folder still. So if you go on Husky CT under virtual SI videos, all the links to my YouTube videos will be there. Um, typically, they'll be uploaded between 8.30 and 9 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. So basically, as soon as this is over, I'm going to upload it um, online, which does take about half an hour or so to do. Um, this week was a little different, doing a Tuesday-Wednesday session, but after this, we will be going back to the normal um, Monday-Wednesday uh, schedule. Okay. Um, so again, if you want a content review, that was last night's session. I'll just put this up. These are the answers to the multiple choice question. Um, but tonight we're going to go through all the answers. So how it's set up is that um, all the questions will be on here. So the next slide will be qu uh, question one with the whole prompt. And I'll also have the answer highlighted. The following slide will be the solution to it. So I'll show the problem for a minute. Then I'll go through the solution. Um, I don't have access to a scanner anymore or a good scanner, so I did have to use my phone. So I do apologize if the um, solutions are kind of hard to see, um, but we're doing the best we can and uh, hopefully can improve it uh, in future weeks. Um, again, feel free to chime in and interrupt me if you have questions at any time. Um, yeah, not quite sure how that part of it's going to work, but again, it's a work in progress. So we'll start with the first question. I'm sorry, these are all screenshots from the practice exam. So you were given um, a chemical equation. One thing you might notice is that only a single product is in the aqueous state. The rest are solids, which means your equilibrium is only going to be affected by CO2, right? We leave solids and liquids out of our equilibrium expression. And so you're told that there's certain amounts of moles of calcium carbonate and calcium oxide. Um, we don't really care that much about it. But what we are given that we do care about is a concentration of CO2, right? So because we have the concentration of that, we can find the equilibrium uh, concentration. So again, this is one of the ones that is worse. Um, a lot of them are better than this, the scanned versions, but we'll do with we, uh, what we can. So the KC for that equation um, in number one will just be equal to the concentration of CO2. But this is a case that they actually ask for the equilibrium, con um, sorry, the equilibrium constant K um, in terms of pressure, so KP, not KC. And so we need to use uh, this equation, um, which you don't use too often, but I would definitely note it because I don't believe it's on your equation sheet, but you do sometimes need to use it. And so we're asked in the problem for Kp. And so Kp is equal to Kc, which we know is 6.62 times 10 to negative second molar, multiplied by R, which is our ideal gas law constant, multiplied by our temperature, uh, which was uh, 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. Do remember to use Kelvin for that. And then Rt is raised to delta Ng, which is the change in moles of gas. So to... Um, Calculate that, you take moles of gaseous product, right? So we had one mole of CO2 gas on our product side minus moles of gaseous reactants. On the reactant side, we had no moles of gas, and so it'd be one minus zero, delta N equals one. Um, and so effectively, Kp is just 6.62 um, times 10 to the negative second, multiplied by R, multiplied by temperature, and it comes out to 1.62. Okay. For number two, this is a classic chart problem. Um, you will definitely be expected to do one of these if you didn't already get it on the last multiple choice exam. 
Um, so in this case, um, each time is like a new almost equilibrium. Um, and your answer here comes out to B. And so we'll see how we got that. Um, so the first data set we're going to use is experiment four or time four to time five, because we want to fill in the data at five. Okay. So uh, we wrote our equilibrium in turn, or we wrote our uh, expression out. So 3A plus B goes to 2C. So we only um, have things that are in a uh, concentration in the equation. I just took out D. And what we do is we write the data for time four, all the known data, um, kind of for the initial point. Now for our change in a chart problem like this, we put it in terms of X, making sure that we put the coefficients in front. Okay, so A is going to decrease by 3x every time, like from uh, time 4 to time 5, while B, because it has a coefficient of 1, will just be minus x. And C will be plus 2x, because again, its coefficient is 2. Now, we actually get data at time 5, 4A, okay, so we find that it's 0.13 at time 5. And so we know that the change minus 3x or 3x is the difference between time 4 and time 5, which is found to be 0 0.09, okay? And so based on that, we can solve for just what x is and then apply the change into the ice table, right? So I plugged 0 0.03 in 4x uh, for, for the change in the lower ice table. So a should decrease by 3 times 0 0.03, b should decrease by just 0 0.03, C should increase, because it's on the other side of the equation, by 2 times 0 0.03. And we can find what the concentration should be at time 5. Okay. Now to find equilibrium, we want to go all the way to the furthest data point we can. So now we want to find the difference between time 5 and time 6. So what you notice is we actually set this ice table up the same as before. So now we use time 5 as our initial concentration. Our change will still be in terms of x, and we'll look the same for all of them. So minus x for a, minus x for b, uh, plus 2x for c, right? And so now we can find that the change between time 4 and time 5 in terms of b is the difference between 0.96 molar and 0.92 molar, which is equal to x. Okay, so we find that x is 0 0.04. We apply the change, right? So we plug it in for x for um, this lower ice table for the change. So A is 0.13 minus 3 times 0 0.04 to have a concentration at time 6 of 0 0.01. We do that for A, B, and C, and we get our time 6 or our equilibrium concentrations. And then to find KC, we just plug those values in, right? With the concentration at equilibrium of uh, C, which in this case is 1.66, and we raise that to the second because it's 2C in the balanced equation, and we put that over our reactants. Our reactants is our concentration of A raised to the third power multiplied by the concentration of B raised to the first power, and that will give you your KC. Okay, so that answer was B, I believe. So just look, yes, it was B. Okay, question three, you're asked for the equilibrium constant, um, or you're told the equilibrium constant Kp for a reaction with um, gaseous nitrous acid uh, with itself, so it's going to react with another molecule of nitrous acid to form diatomic molecules. You're told that Kp. Now they're asking, what is the equilibrium constant for the formation of nitrous acid from the diatomic molecules? So what it's actually asking for here is what is the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction, right? And so it ends up coming out to D, okay? So at the top there, that is the balanced chemical equation they talk about. So two moles of nitrous acid self-react to form three different um, diatomic gas molecules. So uh, hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, and oxygen gas, right? We're given the Kp. Now they ask, what's the Kp for using those diatomic molecules to form nitrous acid? Um, these are, this is one of your K manipulations. And so if you flip the reaction or reverse the reaction, your Kp for the reverse reaction 
equals one over your old KP. Okay, so the KP for that um, reverse reaction is one over 1.09 times 10 to the third, which comes out to 917, which is equal to 917 times 10 to the second. Okay. Now, um, this question, question four, um, the first sentence is identical to the um, previous problem, but the last part is different. It says, what is the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of four moles of gaseous nitrous acid? Okay, so when I first wrote the equation in the last problem, you'll notice, right, I went back a slide. This was number three. We wrote that uh, equation in terms of two moles of um, nitrous acid gas. Okay, which I also wrote at the top again. But in this case, we want the equilibrium constant in terms of if there were four moles of nitrous acid forming diatomic molecules. So in essence, what I'm saying is multiply the entire equation by a coefficient of two. And whenever you do one of these manipulations where you multiply your equation by a specific number, your new K will be equal to your old K raised to that number. So our K of this new equation would be equal to 1.09 times 10 to the negative third squared, which comes out to 1.19 times 10 to the negative sixth. Okay. Are there any questions so far? People are typing them. I don't know if I can see that, but okay. Um, okay, number five is a very classic, um, given data solve for Q and relate it to K problem. Um, and yeah, this is probably pretty similar to how you would see it. So remember that Q is our reaction quotient. It's the same as our equilibrium constant, except it's not necessarily at equilibrium. Okay, so we're given data, right? We're given pressures of all the gases in the chemical equation below. Um, and you're told that the equilibrium constant, or K, is equal to 1.28. Okay, and so, give a second, on the next slide, right, Q plugged in all those numbers, right, so our um, products are on uh, the top, and our reactants are on the bottom here. Remember to square or cube everything that's supposed to based on the balance equation given, but when we solve for that, and again, this is Q, um, we find that it's 1.28, which we compare to the K that was given. And in this case, they're equal. And so it's at equilibrium. So C was the best answer for this. Um, the other ones would only have applied if Q was not equal to K, which they're often not. But in this case, they are. Okay, now moving on to number six. Um, this is one of the Le Chatier's principal problems. Right, so definitely be familiar with these. These will definitely come up um, one or two multiple choice questions, at least I would assume. Um, if you're confused on how this principle works, definitely see my video from yesterday. I go through all the manipulations and um, how those shifts are applied. But in this case, um, you are asked which uh, changes will cause us to shift towards the uh, reactant side. Okay, so when we look through each individual answer, um, the explanation for this is here. It's not too um, helpful, so I'll just go through it um, on my own with you guys. So A is an increase in the pressure of C, right? So um, C is a reactant, and so if we increase the pressure of C, it's like adding um, more moles of C, which will cause us to shift in the opposite direction towards our product side. So that's why that's not correct. A decrease in the volume of the container um, increases the pressure of the container, right? If we increase the pressure of the container, we are going to shift to the side or the, uh, the side of the equation with less moles of gas. So our uh, reactant side has seven moles of gas, right? We just add up those coefficient. Our product side only has five moles of gas. And so a decrease in volume would cause us to shift again towards the product side. C, a decrease in temperature if it is an exothermic reaction, right? So exothermic reactions release heat, which means it's um, kind of like it's a product, right? And if we decrease uh, product, which we're 
effectively doing by decreasing the temperature of an exothermic reaction, we are going to shift to the same side, um, which is the product side. So A, B, and C all cause shift to the product sides. Um, catalyst will speed up the reaction, but doesn't shift equilibrium at all. And so the best answer for six was none of the above. Okay. And that's what this says. Again, this answer was one of the um, ones that didn't uh, scan very well. Okay, number seven, again, a lay shot to here's principal problem. So in the following equation, um, and this one is different, if the pressure of the container is increased by a factor of three, what is the effect on equilibrium? Okay, so again, pressure is increasing. How do we counteract that? We shift um, to the side of the equation that has less moles of gas, right? So if we have less moles of gas, we'll also have less pressure. So that's how it's counteracting it. And so we shift left towards the reactant side in this case. Now, if we had four moles of A, um, then we'd have four moles of gas on the reactant side, four on the product side. If you change pressure or volume um, when there's equal numbers of moles of gas on both sides, then it will not affect your equilibrium, right? You only shift when there's a difference in the number of moles on each side. Um, and again, these ones had the uh, toughest time scanning, but that says resist increase in pressure by shifting towards sides with less moles of gas. The reactant side has three moles of gas, product side is four, and so we shift left towards the reactant side. Okay, um, this one just asked what the conjugate acid base pair are, and so on, um, it's E, right? It will be um, dihydrogen phosphate with hydrogen phosphate is one pair. The other one is water with hydronium, right? Um, and that's because in these equilibria, um, dihydrogen phosphate will act as our acid. Once it loses that H+, plus, um, hydrogen phosphate, HPO4 2 minus, acts as our conjugate base. And then the other pair, water, acts as a base by accepting a proton. Once it's accepted, that proton becomes hydronium, H3O+, plus, which is our conjugate acid to our base. Uh, ones like these are actually pretty important. This, I'm pretty sure, was almost directly off my exam. Yes, it was a little while ago, but being able to identify um, acid and conjugate pairs is important. Okay, this is another one very similar to one off my exam, and it's the dissociation of a strong base leads to a weak conjugate acid. Okay, um, and I think, yeah, this is just a statement that says that. I don't really have anything more to add. Um, what I will say is this. Whenever they set up a problem like this, you will never form a strong conjugate, right? Because what do we know about strong acids? If we have a strong acid like HCl, we assume that it instantaneously and completely dissociates in the H+. Plus and Cl minus. And so you can never form a strong conjugate acid because if you somehow formed HCl, it would immediately dissociate just into H plus and Cl minus. So your answer would never be C or D on a problem like this. Um, the fact that you have a strong base dissociating because it's a base, the conjugate will be an acid. That's why a weak conjugate acid is the best answer. Um, it's better than a strong acid because, I mean, you can't form a strong acid. It's better than F, a weak acid, just because of the word conjugate. Um, and yeah, that's just why F isn't the best answer. But So B is the best answer, um, but you will never form a strong conjugate. That is also an important note to take away. Okay. Now, this one um, asks for the pH of a solution when that amount of base, NaOH, is added. Um, and the answer to this is actually greater than 7. And I know if you um, take the negative log of the hydroxide concentration and solve for it, you come out to, um, I believe, a pH of 4. Um, and this one, again, basically taken completely off my exam, um, that actually fooled the majority of students. And I'll show why that 4 is not the correct answer. Okay, so typically we would find that that much of um, sodium hydroxide leads to 1 times 10 to the negative 10th uh, molar just hydroxide, right? And so when you find that, you would find the pH comes out to 4. But when you think about that, that doesn't really make sense. You have neutral water at a pH of 7 
that you are now adding base to, and somehow it got a lot more acidic, okay? And so in a problem like this, and it's really just for these problems that you have to do it, um, you actually have to take that concentration of hydroxide, 1 times 10 to the negative 10th, and you actually have to factor in the hydroxide concentration of water, right? And so the hydroxide concentration of neutral water is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar, and so your total concentration of hydroxide is 1.001 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. You find your pOH and therefore your pH. Your pH is just barely greater than 7. Got this one wrong. That's completely fine. Um, I got this wrong on the exam. So many people did. Just definitely keep this in mind. It's a trick that they've used in the past. Um, and so... And kind of just think logically about it, right? If you're adding acid to water, it should always get more acidic. If you're adding base to water, it should always get more basic than that neutral value. Uh, don't just necessarily take the, uh, you know, concentration of hydroxide, 1 times 10 to the negative 10th, and find the answer. Because that will actually re uh, lead you to a wrong response in this one. Okay? Okay. Uh, the pH of the solution is 11.4. What's the hydroxide concentration of the solution? Um, so this is just an uh, interconverting one. Okay, um, so if our pH is 11.4, right, we know from our relationship that pH plus pOH equals 14. And so using that pH, we can know that pOH is 2.6. Okay, now pOH equals the negative log um, of our hydroxide concentration. And so when we undo that, we find that the hydroxide concentration would be equal to 10 raised to our negative pOH, which is equal to 10 raised to the negative 2.6, which comes out to 2.51 times 10 to the negative third. Okay, are there any questions so far? You guys see my screen. So if people are typing them, I can't see them. I don't even know how I would do that. Okay. I will assume that there are none then. Okay. So moving on to number 12. So you have a weak acid, which we're just going to call um, HA, and has an initial concentration of 0.36, and you're told the equilibrium pH is 6.26. So this is a very classic ice table problem, in which they actually tell you what X is equal to. Right, because if it's a weak acid, um, X will eventually be equal to H plus at equilibrium. Um, so this is one where you actually work backwards to find Ka, which comes out to A, about 8.4 times 10 to the negative 13. And here's my math for it, right? So we set up our classic ice table. We have uh, weak acid HA. That's an equilibrium with H plus and A minus, right? <laughs> Um, and we enter in our initial amounts, we put our change in terms of x like we've been doing, and we have our equilibrium in terms of x. Now, our pH again is 6.26, and so we can find our concentration of H plus using that, right? So to get our concentration of H plus, we would do 10 raised to the negative 6.26, that gets us a value of 5.5 times 10 to the negative seventh, which again is equal to X. Because that is our concentration of H plus at equilibrium, and that was our pH at equilibrium. Okay, so now we can set up our Ka would be equal to um, our concentration of H plus, which is X, multiplied by our concentration of A minus, which is again also X, so really X squared over 0.36 minus x, right? And so we just plug in x for those values and it comes out to 8.4 times 10 to the negative 13 or so, right? So that was option A, okay? Question 13, an aqueous solution of hydrobromous acid has uh, an initial concentration of 0.222 molar if the Kb is what it is, what is the pH at equilibrium, okay? So conversely to number 12, this is just a classic ice table problem where they want you to work forward and solve for x. Um, one thing I would definitely note that this is a classic trick that you've probably seen them use at least five or six times already 
This is a problem in which we start with a weak ac um, acid, hydro, uh, sorry, that's actually supposed to be hypobromous acid. Uh, hydrobromous acid doesn't exist, but hypobromous acid um, uh, is an acid, and so we should actually use Ka in this problem while they give us Kb, right? So again, I meant to say hypobromous acid, HRO, of point. Um, and the change we put in terms of X, like we typically do. Um, and so okay, A is equal to X squared over 2, 2 minus X. Now, how do we find our KA from our KB? KA is equal to KW. Um, KW, 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, divided by that KB value that they gave us. Um, and so that comes out to uh, 1.36 times 10 to the negative 10th. Um, okay, and so Ka, that value is equal to x squared over 0. 0.222, or 222, yep. Um, you'll see I wrote ignore x. I always like to show that I ignored x, um, so I remember to go back and check the 5% rule. So remember, if it's over 5%, we cannot ignore the x, and we have to use the quadratic. When I solve for x, um, it comes out to 5.4 times the negative sixth, right? And that x is to our concentration of hydronium, H3O+. Plus. Um, and so to find the pH, we just take the negative log of that x value, um, and that gets us a pH of 5.26. Uh, on the side there, um, on the side there, I did a little check of the 5% rule. So to check, you take that x value, so 5.48 times 10 to the negative 6. You divide it by the initial amount of weak acid, so 0.222. Multiply it by 100 to get it into a percentage. In this case, it comes out to just a ridiculously small percentage. Um, and so that justifies that we can actually ignore x in this problem. Okay, um, this again is one basically exactly from my exam. Uh, I don't know whose mic that is, but if you can just uh, mute it, that would be great. Um, I'm not sure if it'll come in the recording or not. Um, question 14, so we're adding uh, strontium phosphate, it's supposed to be SR3, um, but just a little thing. Basically, we add that which of the following statements is true, and it's the solution is neutral. That's the correct answer. And the reason for this, and I see, you'll see my equation for it, SR3PO42 is what it was supposed to be. Um, when you add that to neutral water, you're not really changing the concentration of H plus or hydroxide, right? You're adding strontium with a uh, positive two charge, and then phosphate with its negative three charge. But adding those doesn't affect the amount of H plus or hydroxide in the solution, and so it stays neutral. I know, again, this uh, photocopying wasn't the best, but... Okay, so again, if it doesn't affect the H plus or hydroxide concentration, um, it shouldn't affect the pH of the solution at all. Okay. In this case, you have a weak acid HB that's in equilibrium with its conjugate, B minus. Um, and so really, that's a buffer system, right? We have an acid in its conjugate base. What will happen if the salt of the conjugate base, NAB, recognize that that's really just like adding B minus, uh, which is our conjugate. Um, what happens when that's added to the solution? I said it will become more basic, okay? Um, and the reason why is this equilibria here, right? And so we have um, our... Uh, weak acid reacts with water to form our uh, conjugate base plus hydronium. And so if NAB, aka B minus, is added, it's going to shift, right? This is Le Chatier's principle. It's going to shift towards the other side, the reactant side. Okay, if you're shifting towards the reactant side, you're having less product, right? You're going to have less of that H3O plus hydronium, right? If you have less hydronium or less acid, your solution is going to become more basic, okay? Now, a different way to write this equation um, is 
also shown, right? So if we on the reactant side show it in terms of our conjugate base, right? So our conjugate base reacts with water to form uh, hydroxide and our conjugate weak acid, HB. In this case, if we add B minus, we would shift towards the uh, product side, right? And if we're shifting towards the product side, that means we're going to shift towards um, OH minus our hydroxide. And if we're having more hydroxide, our solution is going to get more basic, right? So this is two different ways to write really the same buffering system. Um, and both of them result in, um, you know, it becoming more basic. It's just showing it in two different ways. Okay. Number 16 was my attempt at a, just a theoretical um, acid problem. And so the answer to this um, is which ones are false. And the only statement um, or statement B and D are both uh, true. Statement A and C are incorrect. Um, so I didn't touch on in the review yesterday because it's kind of a small topic, but you might want to review acid strength, right? And so one of them, let me see what my explanation for this was. Um, yeah, this explanation is pretty good. So perchloric acid is actually stronger than hypochlorous acid. Right, and so when we're dealing with those polyatomics, right, um, the polyatomic ClO minus ClO2 minus ClO3 minus ClO4 minus, right, you might remember those from last semester. The more oxygens, um, the stronger the acid is, right. So perchloric acid, because it has four of oxygens, will be stronger than hypochlorous acid, which only has one oxygen. Um, and you might also remember if you know your strong acids, perchloric acid is actually one of those six strong acids that you have to learn for this class. So if you knew that, you would know that that one was incorrect. Um, B was correct. The higher the Ka's represent more dissociation, right? If your Ka is high, that means more product is being formed, which represents the numerator in a Ka. Um, and so higher Ka's represent stronger acids. And then um, C is actually incorrect. Um, that one was actually added to trick you guys. And the reason for that is um, we learned from B that the higher the Ka, the stronger the acid. When you take the negative log of that, it actually makes it flip. And so the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. Okay, so your strong acids would have really high Ka's and really low, maybe even negative pKa's, while Weak acids will have lower Ka's and higher pKa's, okay? Which makes sense for pKa's because pKa is kind of on the um, pH scale. And so if your pKa is higher, that means it's kind of more basic, okay? So weaker acid is kind of like more basic, okay? Okay. Now question 17 and 18, I have... Um, kind of together because the solutions you do together, it's a classic diprotic acid problem. Um, this will, in my opinion, 100% be on your exam on Friday. Um, typically they use carbonic acid. I just use a generic um, diprotic acid, uh, H2B. Um, and so again, if you're not quite sure how to go about these, um, the video yesterday I touch upon it, um, but these, you basically do two separate ice tables because they have two different Ka's. Um, and so the first question is what's the pH, which comes out to uh, 2.6. The second question, which is question 18, is what is the concentration of B2 minus um, in the solution at equilibrium? Okay, so now I'm going to flip to the answers for both of those. It's split up over, I think, three slides. Okay, so um, at the top, I write my first equilibria. So this is between my weak, um, my weak acid, H2, H2B, will react with water to form my conjugate base, HB minus, plus hydronium, right? We put our change in terms of X, and we write that equal to Ka1. So Ka1, which is given, is equal to 8.14 times 10 to the negative fifth, which is equal to our uh, products multiplied together, so x times x, which is x squared, over our equilibrium concentration of our reactants, um, which you will notice, and I wrote a little note, 
that we actually ignored x for that. Um, and we went through, we solved for x. When you solve for x, it should come out to 0 0.0025 or so, right? And again, in the left, uh, sorry, the right hand side, you'll notice I did a check in which I took x 0 0.00251, divided it by my equilibrium concentration of my starting acid, so 7.71 times 10 to the negative second. And I solved and found that it was 3.3%. And so because that's less than 5%, I can ignore X. Um, it satisfies the 5% rule. Okay. And so the last thing at the bottom of this slide, what it shows is just my um, equilibrium concentrations in terms of, I just got rid of X and put it in terms of actual um, numerical values, right? So our equilibrium concentration of HB minus is 0 0.00251. Our hydroniums is 0 0.00251 as well. Um, and H2B is 7.71 times 10 to the negative second. You don't have to subtract X from that because it's less than 5%. Um, but if you do, it's also correct. Okay. And so now we set up our second ice table. So this is going to be between HB minus um, and B2 minus, right? So it's the second proton is being lost in this ice table. Okay, um, definitely notice that for diprotic acid problems, you will have an initial amount, so a starting amount of both HB minus, which will be a reactant, okay, and of um, hydronium, H3O plus, right? Those are equilibrium values from the previous ice table. Um, and so we have to carry those values over. Next, what we do is we put our change in terms of X, um, and then we get our equilibrium concentrations of those three uh, things listed uh, in terms of X. Now, because this is our second equilibrium system, we set it equal to Ka2, right? So it's that second Ka value listed, which is 6.46 times 10 to the negative eighth. That is equal to our products divided by our reactants, okay? And so what happens, and this happens in every problem I have seen for diprotic acids, is that you'll be able to ignore X in both the numerator and the denominator, right? So we don't have to add X or subtract X. We can ignore those. When I went on to check, it came out to 0.0026%. So a tiny, tiny percent. Um, we can easily ignore it. And what ends up happening is X ends up equaling Ka2, right? Because our um, 0 0.00251s cancel each other out. And so X, which equals our concentration of B2 minus, um, is equal to Ka2, which is 6.46 times 10 to the negative 8. Again, on an exam, I have never seen a problem where this is not true. Okay, so if they ask for the concentration of carbonate, CO3, 2 minus, in a problem like this, I have not seen a problem where it does not equal the constant, uh, just whatever your Ka2 is. I have always found them to be equal. Um, I would still suggest doing the math out, but if you're running out of time um, or your math is messing up, you're not getting an answer. When in doubt, that is a safe bet. Okay, so that's the answer to 18. Hey, before you move on, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Uh um, so how how can I just I can just always assume that the hydronium is going to be the same from the previous reaction, like the concentration amount, like the initial amount. Oh uh, yeah. Yes, you do have to carry over. So in a problem like this, right in our first ice table, we find that X point zero zero two five one is our equilibrium concentration of HB minus and H three O plus. You will carry that over every time um, to the second ice table. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so again, those cancel out and 6.46 times 10 to the negative eighth would be your answer to um, 18. But we still have to answer number 17, which I do on the next page. Um, so question 17 asked for our pH. And so we wanna calculate our total H plus concentration. Now we get H plus, which is the same as hydronium, H3O plus, from both our first ice table and our second ice table, right? Because they're equal to X at equilibrium at both. So from the first ice table, we find that we would have a concentration of 0 0.00251 molar. 
And from our second ice table, we would have an additional 6.46 times 10 to the negative eighth, right? So if you add those together and take the negative log of it, your pH would be 2.6. Now I talked about this very briefly in my video yesterday, another kind of shortcut for diaprotic acid problems. I have personally, again, never seen a diaprotic acid problem where they ask about pH where you can't do it just based on the first um, ice table. And so what I mean by that is if you took your X value for H3O plus from that first ice table, so if you took the negative log of just 0 0.00251 um, and you found the pH of that, it would also come out to 2.6. Um, so in essence, you actually don't need to add the 6.46 times 10 to the negative eighth um, to get the correct answer. Now, again, personally, I would probably add them together on my calculator and take the negative log of it because um, you won't be wrong if you do that. But typically, um, your sig figs will make it so that um, it doesn't actually affect your results. Okay. So if you take the pH of just the H plus concentration you get at the end of the first ice table, that should be sufficient to find your pH in a diprotic acid problem. Um, again. I would prefer that you go through both and add them together, but typically it won't actually affect your answer. Okay, um, question 19 is a problem where you're actually given your KP and you're just solving for an unknown pressure. So this one ends up coming to 4.4 or so. And so in the next page, to do that. Um, KP, which is 8.88 times 10 to the second, is equal to... Um, our products raised to their respective power. So you definitely need to know that the unknown that you're solving for has to be raised to the third. I forget what um, chemical it is, but it's raised to the third. Um, our other product is raised to the second. And our reactants are in the denominator, right? I solve for, I isolate X cubed, which X cubed is equal to uh, 85 or 86 or so. Um, and then you take the cube root of that, and your answer should come out to 4.4 or so. Okay. 20 is which of the following answers is a K value that best represents an equation that has a higher concentration of reactants in relation to products at equilibrium? Um, again, this is a very similar to a question that appeared on my exam. I think mine was just um, higher concentration of products in relation to reactants at equilibrium, so kind of just flipped. So just realize that our equilibrium constant, K, very generically, is products over reactants, right? And so if we want a higher concentration of reactants in relation to products, right, that means we want a really big denominator and a really small numerator, which means K would come out to a small number, right? And so the smallest number which is about four times 10 to the negative 17th, A would have the highest amount of reactants in relation to products at equilibrium, right? Okay, now again, I know your, um, your, the rest of your exams are all multiple choice exams, um, but I will in my practice always include one to three long answer ones um, just to see how you guys do with them. And so this one is a weak monoprotic acid. Uh, I would definitely know the terms monoprotic, diprotic, and triprotic, right? The prefixes for protic just indicate how many protons it has. So a monoprotic acid just has a single proton. Um, diprotic acids is like carbonic acid, H2CO3. An example of a triprotic acid would be phosphoric acid, H3PO4, okay? So a weak monoprotic acid is found to dissociate 3.6% uh, when in water. If 1.7 moles of this acid is added to 2 liters of water, what will the pH be at equilibrium? And it comes out to 1.51, okay? And so this is the solution for it. So I set up my ice table. I just use HA to denote a weak monoprotic acid. That reacts with water to produce the conjugate base and hydronium. Right, we put the change in terms of X, but that dissociate, that 3.6% dissociation actually helps us solve for X, okay? Um, and you can set up how I did, or um, you can kind of just do math on the side. But um, dissociation or percent ionization, they mean the same thing. The equation for that is that the percent ionization 
or again, dissociation equals um, our equilibrium value of hydronium, right? H3O plus, so X divided by the initial, remember that it's initial, initial concentration of weak acid times 100. And so what we find X is, which is our equilibrium concentration of H3O plus, is that it's 0 0.0306. Essentially, what that equation does is it just takes 3% or 3.6% of 0.85. Okay, so if you converted 3.6% into a decimal and multiply that by 0.85, you would get the same exact answer. Okay. Now, uh, where'd you get the point? Yes. Oh, sorry. Where'd you get the 0.85 from? The 0.85, sorry, um, that's our um, concentration of um, weak acid, right? So we had 1.7 moles in 2 liters, and so the concentration would be 0.85 molar. Oh, okay, okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sorry, I kind of skipped that step in my head. And so the reason why I converted it straight to uh, concentration is if you put it in terms of moles on the ice table, your X value for um, hydronium, H3O plus, would be in terms of moles, right? But when we convert to pH, we need it to be in terms of um, concentration. And so I converted straight to concentration, put the concentration of that weak acid for my initial, and then solve for X in terms of uh, concentration of hydronium. Um, so, so it would have been okay if I had put the 1.7 in the table, but eventually divided it by two, like later on before putting it in the equation? Correct. I believe if you solve this ice table in terms of moles, so if you had an initial of 1.7 and solved for X and then divided X by two liters, it should have given you the same answer. All right. Okay. Yep. Um, great question. Um, and so the pH is just taking the negative log of that uh, concentration of uh, hydronium and it comes out to 1.5 or so. Um, again, just... They typically don't bring up um, percent ionization or dissociation too much, um, but definitely be aware of it and how they can give you information, like in this problem, um, like through that uh, value. They can also ask about theoretic, like theoretical questions about it. So again, realize that strong acids dissociate or ionize more than weaker acids, um, and even amongst weak acids. Um, right, hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid, but it is a stronger acid than water, for example. And so the the dissociation uh, percent dissociation or ionization of hydrofluoric acid will be higher than water. It's again, it's a stronger acid. Um, so that's how it could show up, kind of as a multiple choice as well. Okay, and then the last one, um, you've actually seen this equation before. Four on the previous practice exam, it was just reversed. Um, and that time you solved for total pressure and then something for a solid. But this is one again relating, although solids don't show up in your equilibrium constant, um, they still do change, right? So in this case, um, you are at equilibrium, you're given a bunch of time, you're at standard temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the volume is 1.75. A reaction occurs and during that reaction this is the part you care more about um, the partial pressure of sulfur dioxide right so our pressure of sulfur dioxide was 2.45 initially and it decreased um, 0.62 atm throughout the experiment okay and so what happened is that amount that it decreased that pressure was converted to product and so really you're trying to find how many grams of product did you form okay and here's my work, uh, my, all my work for that. Um, so at the top, I just wrote the equation that was given, and I wrote my ice table in terms of my initial pressure of SO2 gas. So that's really the only numbers we're given. The change was how much it decreased. So it decreased 0.62 atmospheres, which means at equilibrium, or what we're calling equilibrium, um, the pressure of SO2 gas would have been 1.83 atmospheres. Okay. Now, whenever we're trying to relate a gas or something in equilibrium to a solid, always use the ideal gas law, right? So PV equals NRT. Um, the commonality that you can interconvert between these species is moles. So you will be solving for moles of SO2 based on the pressure. 
Okay. So what I did is I solved um, where it says initial. I'm solving for the initial number of moles of SO2 gas, right? So to solve for that, I plugged in my initial amount uh, or my initial pressure of SO2 gas, so 2.45 atmospheres, multiplied that by the volume, um, and then divided that by R, our ideal gas law constant, multiplied by 298 Kelvin, which is standard temperature in terms of Kelvin, and I found that we initially had 0.175 moles of SO2. Okay, now I did the same thing at the end, so my final or equilibrium um, moles of SO2, uh, I also solved for. So the only difference in this calculation is I plugged in my equilibrium pressure of SO2 gas um, instead of my initial. So I used 1.84 atm of gas multiplied by the volume divided by R and T. And I found that at the end of the hour, end of the experiment, um, at equilibrium, I had 0.131 moles of SO2 remaining, okay? Which means the difference between them is how much was used up to form product, okay? So I find by subtracting those values that 0 0.044 moles of SO2 was used during uh, the reaction to form product. Now, there's another way you can actually solve for this. If you solve for N, um, but for pressure, you plug in the change. So if you, you know, use the same volume, R value and T value that I did, and you put 0.62 ATM for your pressure, you would actually um, get 0.044 moles directly. Because by plugging in the change, you're actually solving for how many moles um, were used up in the reaction. Okay? Um, or you can do it the way I did. Either would get you the same answer. Now that we know that during this um, experiment, 0 0.044 moles of SO2 was used up, we um, used stoichiometry to find how many moles of um, KHSO3 was formed. So definitely remember that it's a two to one ratio here. And then I asked for grams. So you just multiply it by its molar mass, which was slightly over 120 grams per mole. And that comes out to a little bit over 10 and a half grams would have to be added or uh, would have been, uh, sorry, produced um, by that loss of SO2. Okay, so this is a classic example of using information of something that exists in the equilibrium and using that to find out information um, about a species like a solid that does not appear in uh, equilibrium. Okay. So, oops, sorry about that. I don't know where I am right now. Okay. And so that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Nope. My thing is now up. I didn't mean to do that. Any questions? Uh, would you be willing to go over the notes that you went over at the beginning again or no? Uh, which notes at the beginning? Did you do any notes at the beginning or did you just start with questions? Um, typically what happens is on typical Wednesdays of exam week, my plan will be to do a kind of a notes review of the chapters and then go over the practice like we did. Um, but because this week was kind of different and it's been a while since break, um, Yesterday's session was a review of um, kind of like the notes and the material. Um, and so that video is already up. If you go on Husky CT under virtual SI videos, I'm not able to put the links or I'm not able to put the actual videos in. It kept giving me, I don't know, I tried to upload it four times and it failed. Um, but it's in that folder are links to the YouTube video. Um, and so that video was uh, posted last night. All right, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Will you be posting the answers to the practice exam? Um, I'm debating it. I might just put the physical answers, uh, which you guys can all still... Oh, where, have you been able to see my screen the whole time? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. So you can see it now, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so here are the actual just answers. I'm not sure if I will post um, the scanned portions. 
I have to see. Some of them came out pretty poorly. Um, and this whole session will be recorded. So if people want to kind of skip um, and go to the respective uh, answers they're confused about, I might help them do that. Um, but I'm still, I'm still debating that. So they might be, if not, this session will be probably posted. The link should be posted in about half an hour. Um, worst case you can click and kind of just drag through. Are there any other questions? Okay. Last chance. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, and yeah, good luck on your exam. Email me if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Have a good one.